Okay, video two for species interactions. So we talked about kind of the introduction for species interactions and the conceptual basis for competition. And then the link between competition and coexistence because it is possible for individuals and species to compete yet still coexist. So now let's dive into competitive exclusion, which is the de denial of coexistence. And then we'll switch gears into mutualism. So competitive exclusion is the opposite of coexistence. Competitive exclusion drives competitively weak species to extinction, either locally, just in that area, or potentially globally. Species richness, if one species leaves, is extirpated. Species richness is reduced, but in turn may allow other species to join the community and then themselves proliferate. So if one species leaves, there's potentially this niche space that's unfilled that maybe a more competitively dominant species could move in. Competitive exclusion could be a significant factor driving the process of community development and evolution. So these individuals, again, following thinking from a disturbance perspective, a disturbance happens and these species move in and then they start, uh, they start competing. Remember that ecosystem shifts, that community shifts from one driven by colonization to one driven by competition. So they start competing and that competition really drives community development. And there's multiple types of competitive exclusion. The first is interference, where there's that direct competitive behavior, which negatively affects either survivorship or growth or fecundity of opponents. This is really common in sessile or territorial organisms. So sessile being like they can't move. Uh, and and territorial organisms say like birds or something uh, that has a territory all of those which need to secure an area of habitat space like they have an actual space that they occupy and can be moved out by a more competitively dominant species so an example you see in this image um, these are like mussels on a beach intertidal rocky zone and we have an area that uh, is closer to the water and an area that's further to the water. And again, the tide goes up and then it goes down. So if we think of these species as filter feeders, they need water. If it gets too high, they start, they die, right? If it gets too wet, they're probably fine. So the species that is more competitively dominant probably wants to be in that better habitat, lower down towards that water. And so looking at this image, which of these two species the in the cartoon the blue or the brown which of these two species is probably more competitive if we recognize that the better habitat is closer to the water the species closer to the water is probably competitively dominant so that blue species and it's interfering in shoving that other species more outside or to the margins of its niche areas that are like less quality habitat and that's interference the second one then type of competitive exclusion is resource exploitation so the total supply of resources is smaller than the amount required by all existing organisms so resource use by one species causes a negative effect on another species and this is kind of by definition of competition remember from the that first video species or individuals are competing for a shared resource and that shared resource has to be limiting it also has to be something that gets used up in resource exploitation so the using up of that resource by one individual leaves the other resource leaves the other individual without that resource this is really easy to show in controlled experiments but actually pretty difficult to demonstrate exclusion of species in the field like just look at this image of a prairie like there's loads of species there it's just really difficult from a quantitative standpoint to go out into the field into nature and show resource exploitation but intuitively and experimentally uh, we know it's true another type of competitive exclusion which is kind of a little different than the other two is habitat modification so an organism moves in and then modifies the characteristics of habitats through just their normal life maintaining activities. This often is incidental. It's kind of one-sided competition, which happens to lead to competitive exclusion. So one individual moves in 
It's just doing what it does, and it happens to shove out another species. So an example is commonly uh, cheatgrass moves in. Cheatgrass is an invasive species. It moves in to an area, and it dries out in like mid midsummer and is very very flammable so areas that have lots of cheatgrass burn quite regularly and that cheatgrass then continues to spread and spread and spread that fire is really good for cheatgrass so when cheatgrass comes in the fire regime changes competitively or whatever just sort of excluding because of that fire getting rid of that other species just because the cheatgrass is increasing fire frequency and that is a, in a way competitive exclusion through habitat modification. Okay, so that's competition and competitive exclusion. Now let's switch gears and think about individuals and species actually getting along, cooperating in coexistence, and we call this mutualism. So the general concept of mutualism is really where both species benefit from the interaction. What happens if we think about, think about that intertidal zone, there is an area, there's a lower limit to where those species can exist and an upper limit to where those species can exist. And we'll think about that as the niche. Now let's pretend in this mutualism example that there are, is some mutualism uh, between two muscles. If there's a mutualism that is beneficial for both species, it actually increases the niche space niche space of both species so that uh, they can exist in a broader set of environments than they would otherwise in the absence of that mutualism. So in this interaction, this mutualism involves continuous intimate contact between species. We call that a symbiosis. You've heard of symbiotic relationships and symbioses. That is a type of mutualism. Mutualisms really in the past have been regarded as this biological curiosity, as something that's not super common, uh, but we're increasingly recognizing that it's really an important form of interaction and uh, a primary source of evolutionary innovation. A lot of species change in response to mutualism because it's so beneficial for both species. Uh, mutualisms often involve more than two species, so it's easy to think about just two individuals kind of helping each other, but often it's a whole network of individuals um, that make that network stronger because of more than two species. The world's biomass is largely composed of mutualists. Again, historically we thought it was kind of an oddity, uh, but as we start thinking about mutualisms and species uh, positive responses to other species, we start to realize that really the majority of, of species and biomass is composed of these mutualists. So why should we be concerned with mutualisms in disturbance ecology, in disturbed lands? Well, post-disturbance recovery often involves groups of mutualistic species, and rarely we're thinking about just one species. If in, an, if in a post-disturbance environment we're talking about one species, that must be a a pretty special species or a pretty severely disturbed environment because most disturbed environments have that network of mutualistic species. Also, if we think about mutualisms expanding that niche space of species, we can also acknowledge that disturbed environments are often pretty harsh. And so those disturbed environments are themselves on the edge of that niche space for a species. So for a species to even exist there, sometimes it requires that mutualism for that species to exist because it's so marginal in its habitat quality. And these key mutualisms are important in successional development uh, facilitation. We can think of sort of those relay floristics of one species helping another, in turn uh, making it a better environment for a different suite of species. And from a restoration perspective, if we think about species that work together and are stronger together than they are individually, then restoration success can be increased by understanding what those species are and providing for those key mutualisms. And it's important to remember just in these disturbed environments that few if any organisms occur without mutualistic partners. It might be mutualisms below ground that you can't see. It might be between two plants. It might be between plants and animals. 
but few individuals, few organisms, occur without the potential for mutualisms. And this post-disturbance recovery involves the recovery of species assemblages. So think about we're trying to we're trying to understand how these communities, these species assemblages come together, not just these individual species. So what are some important mutualisms in post-disturbance environments? Well, often if we're looking at fairly rocky areas, we'll see lichens, and lichens themselves are a mutualism, a symbiotic relationship between algae and fungi, one providing kind of the structure and the home, in the fungi and one providing kind of a food source in the algae and they sort of trade food for a home. Another example is between plants and fungi. We have mycorrhizae uh, in the soil. So fungi aids plants in nutrient or water uptake in exchange for carbon in the form of sugars. We might have uh, ectomycorrhizae in uh, lots of temperate forest trees have ectomycorrhizae where those um, the fungi hyphae underground are nearby and uh, kind of surround the root tissues of trees, but they don't actually get inside the trees. In contrast that with arbuscular mycorrhizae that actually go inside the tissues, the root tissues of, uh, of lots of lots of plants, and they actually make that trade for captured resources, nitrogen or water, in exchange for carbon in the form of sugars. Plants and diazotrophs, diazotrophs being these nitrogen-fixing bacteria. We talked about some in some post-disturbance environments like primary succession. Remember primary succession, uh, there's really no soil nutrients. So some of these mutualisms allow for species to exist in these really harsh environments and fix nitrogen from nitrogen gas and then use that nitrogen for biological activity. So legumes are often uh, a mutualism with uh, these rhizobia in the soil. Uh, and then there's uh, Frankia is another kind of diazotroph with a whole lot of plant families and, and genera across the world. We can also think of mutualisms in a more kind of abstract way between plants and animals as dispersal agents. So these plants are relying on birds and other animals to dis distribute their seeds. That inherently is kind of them working together in a mutualistic way. One providing food for those birds and the other, the bird, providing a dispersal agent for the offspring of those plants. Other examples of plants and animals could be pollinators, so trading nectar for the pollination of uh, creating more seeds, right, and honeybees and loads of other, loads of other pollinators. Or defense, this picture, uh, this sort of needle-like structure, this is an acacia tree, and this is a structure that uh, has an ant crawling out of it. So this is uh, an acacia tree has these thorns and the ants sort of uh, excavate out the thorns is my understanding. And those thorns serve as a home and housing for those uh, for those ants. And the ants in turn chase away and protect the plant from other herbivores and insects. So insects start crawling on the ants onto the tree. The ants come out and chase that uh, chase that intruder away. So this mutualism providing a home and providing security and protection. We might also have animal-animal uh, -animal mutualism. So this is uh, an example that was new to me, but uh, these are tiny little aphids and a bigger black ant. And the ant will sort of tap on the aphid, and the aphids will secrete a sugary goo stuff that the ant will consume. And then the ant, in turn, chases away like ladybugs and other things that are coming to eat the aphid so it offers protection in exchange for sugar. And lastly I wanted to mention um, the potential evolution of mutualisms because it is really interesting thinking about these long long times time frames and thinking about evolution and and how these mutualisms came to be and there's a few different theories and mechanisms of how uh, mutualisms came to be. One could be just 
accidental liaison turning into a mutualism, like two individuals, two species coming together, and it sort of ends up working for both species, and the individuals that take advantage of that mutualism end up having more offspring, and that mutualism gets really ingrained in their genetics. Another example is parasitism, which turns into mutualism. So many highly evolved symbioses are so highly evolved that they become single organisms. So this is a parasite uh, turning into a mutualism, which then itself turns into a single species, which sounds kind of crazy, right? But actually, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that vascular plants, so plants like normal plants we think of, are actually uh, evolved symbioses between fungi and cyanobacteria. Ugh, isn't that crazy? So it started out as this uh, mutualism, this symbiosis between these two things, and then it became plants as we know them today. But then there are other examples of, again, this parasitism uh, leading into a mutualism. If we think about, if you think about uh, like the cells that we look at that are in our own body in most animals and all animals and plants prokaryotes versus eukaryotes you might remember from high school biology or maybe biology here at csu um, the eukaryotes have a nucleus in it and there's a lot of evidence or thought to suggest that what used to be two different prokaryotes one sort of consumed the other, and the nucleus within our eukaryotic cells is actually a prokaryote inside another prokaryote, and those act together in sort of this eukaryotic way. So that's this interesting evolution. And then there are some examples of commensalism turning into mutualism. Um, I don't have a good example of that, but I know that that uh, is sort of another example of uh, mutualisms being solidified into the genetics of individuals. But that is it for species interactions. I hope you are all well, and feel free, as always, to email me with any questions or concerns you have. Take care.